Hi, welcome to Showing Up. My name is Pam. And about a month ago, I, I got struck by an idea that I would like to somehow share some of the knowledge and wisdom I've learned with some of my biggest mentors. And I'd say a month later, I ended up here creating this uh, show. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my guest, Nigel Thurlow. Hi, Nigel. Oh, no, we're live. Oh, okay. Hey, Pam. <laughs> Nigel is an author, international keynote speaker, creator of Scrum the Toyota Way, and the co-creator of the Flow System and the CEO of the Flow Consortium. The first ever to hold the role of Chief of Agile in Toyota globally, he developed training and transformation approaches to enable agility in Toyota by combining Scrum with Lean, which achieved global recognition with an award from the World Agility Forum. Nigel left Toyota at the end of 2019. He was the first professional scrum trainer globally in Toyota and the first trainer to have been certified by both the creators of scrum training over 75,000 people. Is that right, Nigel? No, 7,500, Pam. I'm okay. good, but not that good, apparently. <laughs> Nigel has published several peer-reviewed white papers and journal publications on team science, and he acts as an advisor on several boards at the University of North Texas. He was recently featured by Forbes and is the co-author of the upcoming book, The Flow System. Welcome, Nigel. Hey, Pam. How, How are, are you I'm, doing? I've got mirror image going on here, so I'm trying to wave with the opposite hand. I'm doing well. How are you? Look at that smile. This is why people <laughs> turn up for Pam. This is why people show up for Pam. <laughs> Thank you. Nice hashtag. Very nice. Are you ready? Oh, hell, I've been ready for hours. I've been so excited waiting for this. Okay, so my first question to you is I want you to tell me who's been showing up for you. Who's been there to help you su help support you over the last few months? Well, you know, it's interesting because we're all going through a bit of a tough time, and I promise to keep this exciting and, and it's inspiring. But a lot of people have showed up for me. I mean, I could l l read out a long list. Of course, the usual suspects like family and my, my beautiful wife who's been helping me out significantly recently. And I'm very lucky that she's a chef. So this lack of eating out and lack of takeout food, I get to eat beautifully well. Um, but a lot of my ex-colleagues, you included, <laughs> have really helped me in the last few weeks and months. It's been a tough time since the whole current condition came around. And, and I found myself getting very low and wondering how I was going to solve things and fix things. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, Dan and Roger, we used to work with. You remember Dan and Roger have been there. Of course. Um, my, my good friend and co-author and co-creator, Ponch, and, and John Turner mm -hmm. as well, Professor Turner. So mm -hmm. to collectively, everybody's been keeping me busy and keeping me focused, which is mm -hmm. let me focus less on bad things, much more on good things. Um, and then I started inviting people just to reach out and contact me. And so I've had a whole string of people from scrum masters and agile coaches up to business leaders who've been asking me for some support, for some advice and some help. And that's again helped me to keep focused. So I believe that a lot of people have shown up and really helped me, and it's made me feel a lot better in myself. And today I got an email from a, a, such an old friend of mine, somebody I worked with 20 years ago, emailed wow. me today. So I'm really looking forward to replying to that email. Excellent. So what are we now? We're in May of 2020. What have you learned so far this year? Well, that's a huge question. So... <laughs> I mean, I've learned a lot of, I learned continuously, but what I have really focused on and understood is that I've realized we didn't understand all the things that were to understand. I realized we weren't prepared as well as we should be, whether that's supply chain and medical supplies or the global condition right now. Um, and so a lot of the work I've been doing with Professor Snowden on things like sense making, complexity thinking, and various other topics around that have helped me to realize there are many more tools and techniques, many more uh, skills that I needed to learn mm -hmm. to be able to make sense of the world we're now in. So despite my fortunate career and despite all the training I've had, I've realized there's a lot of new knowledge that I needed, which I'm now sharing with other people and then learning from them as they share back with me. Um, but I, do re I did realize we don't have all the answers. We'll probably never have all the answers. And we can't always put things into a nice, neat bucket. Um, and I'm going to share a book 
this is a book I've been reading by Dan Lyons called Lab Rats. Okay. I'll bring that in a little bit closer. <laughs> I, um, can see I, I urge everybody in the IT industry to read the first chapter, even if they read nothing more. And Dan Lyons can be reasonably controversial, but read mm -hmm. chapter one. I think everybody will echo on that. And I learned a lot from reading chapter one of that book. And that's no plug for Dan. I don't know Dan Lyons, but I, I picked up this book, read chapter one, and went, that described a lot of my life last year. Read chapter one. Okay. So, Nigel, I know you have a lot of experience with working with C-suites and leaders and so forth. If you had to quantify, um, give me maybe three things that you think from your experience that you feel the C-suite's doing really well, and then maybe some opportunities for improvement there. Mm, they're panicking really well right now. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's, uh, that's, that's good. Um that's a broad question. I think that from a point of view of how they're responding, they're recognizing that the techniques and tools and thinking they used to solve problems before are now not the right tools and techniques. So they are becoming much more open to conversation. Okay. I do think they're in a little chaos, and I think that's natural. I think that's understandable. They're in chaos. They're trying to figure out what are we going to do. We've never really faced challenges like this before from how we're going to retool our offices. And if you run a factory or a plant, how we're going to retool machines and equipment. Right. Um, to how we're going to keep our people safe, how we're going to adapt to this new zombie world this online sort of world of sort of webinar fatigue and zombie calls mm -hmm. um so i think that there is a, a lot of learning going on from the from the leaders i'm speaking to they are also recognizing they don't have the answers which i think is a positive thing and right. they reach out for help it's not that i've got all the answers but people i talk with people who work with me we have some of the answers we can direct and guide into areas where other people have got the answers. So I think that it's hard to give you three of each, but there's recognition and realization, there's deep caring and for their people, and there is a sense of, of panic and trying to figure out ways to solve that. But at the same time, they're learning new tools, mm -hmm. they're exploring new ideas, and they are open to discussion about how to adapt for the future. We will have to adapt. And these are positive things. These are good things. I mean, not everybody's going to – there's going to be some disruption in industry, but people are going to find a way to cope with what we call the new normal for the time being. Organizations will find a way, and the C-suite will adapt. It's going to be a journey, um, but some of the people probably listening to this, this are the people who are going to help them on that journey. So there are some real positives coming out of this. There's a lot of learning to still happen. And I did read a, a post today which sort of says we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. Many people are in different boats, which I thought was very, very sort of philosophical. Well, I don't know what the word yeah. is, very philosophical, because there are people who – are suffering the same storm we all are but better equipped than other people so we have to look at different tools and techniques approaches methods different ways of guiding people through the same storm but at different levels of maturity capability and different levels of survivability from a point of view economics and family so i think there's a lot of good will come out of that a lot of rapid learning and the best executives i'm seeing at the moment are the ones who are willing to embrace rapid learning and, and rapid ad adaptation of new techniques and new approaches. And I was even looking at one of my close friends and mentors, John Shook, today, writing a superb piece on LinkedIn about how GE and other organizations are adapting, which shows us the challenge we've all got ahead, but it also shows how they can a gigantic corporation can adapt really, really quickly. So I think there's some huge positives in that. Okay. That's a good answer. So... um. More recently than not, I get contact by a lot of folks who perhaps they're business analysts or teachers or so forth, and they now understand what Scrum is. Maybe they've taken a class, gotten a certification in Scrum Master, or even product ownership, but they're having trouble getting a position because they don't have the experience that's needed. So I'm curious, I know people contact you. What would you advise someone in that position to do to try to break into that area? So it is a real, real struggle. And I've had this question asked for me for many, many years. Mm -hmm. The challenge with it that most people want somebody with experience in mm -hmm. scrum. 
Mm -hmm. The reality of it is a lot of people have a lot of experience in areas that they don't make visible when they're talking to people about a scrum master role or a coaching role or something within that scrum or agile context. The other thing is to realize that scrum is a simple, repeatable pattern. It's particularly a planning cadence. It's a planning tool, not an execution tool. And that's defined by the creators of scrum. Right. Um so actually knowing Scrum is only a very small part of being a Scrum master or somebody who can coach effective teams. What I urge people to do is to look back in their career and make visible the things that they have done in their past, their analytical skills, their team leadership skills, their team building skills. And I'm not talking about building marshmallow towers with pasta sticks. I'm talking about how we build great interpersonal relationships and cognitions I'm sorry, Pam, with, uh, with different okay. team members. I mean, I kept telling them to go read the flow system stuff because there's a lot of it incorporated in that, but I'm not interested in saying we'll learn this instead of that. What I think people need to do is to look, and I've, done, I've talked to a lot of military vets about this, to look back into mm -hmm. their deep skills. I mean, military vets have immense team building skills and team leadership skills. These are actually more important than learning Scrum as a tool or as an approach, or if you prefer a framework. Mm -hmm. So they need to start making those other skills visible. How have I solved problems? How have I uh, related to people? How have I understood challenges? How have I enabled the elimination of waste in processes? How have I optimized the way we did things? Right. Look at all those other skills and bring those to the visible front. Put those together with a piece of paper and some minor scrum experience or some learning you've done there. Then organizations will see you as a holistic, well-rounded person who's very capable at coaching improvement within teams, in small groups, and within product delivery. So don't just become scrum, and that's mm -hmm. the only thing you're showing because you're missing years of practice and development there. Okay, I like that. That's a, I like the way you coordinated that and drawing from your experience and using that. So now we talk about the flow system, and I know when I first saw it, as usual, when you put something out, my head kind of falls off the ground because I think, what is he talking about? I'm trying to imagine myself maybe five or six years ago where, again, I had a little bit of knowledge, but there's, it doesn't really kind of compare to where I've grown. And I'm wondering if I'm, say, someone who's been a Scrum Master for three or four years, and then I see the flow system and I read about it, how can I begin to utilize some of those tools and techniques into what I'm doing and even understand them? Because I feel like at some point there's a you have to kind of make a leap to actually understand a lot of that. So the key thing is this is not a framework. This is not another replacement for some agile thing or a scrum thing. It's not meant to be a framework. It's not meant to be a new prescriptive methodology. And actually, if people read the flow guide, you'll realize there's no prescription in there. We purposely didn't put a prescription in there because right. we're getting into the world of complex adaptive systems. If people want to understand a complex adaptive system, an aircraft is complicated, and I'm channeling my close colleague Ponch here. So an aircraft is complicated. Lots of moving pieces, lots of uh, elements that need to be worked through, but a checklist is effective in an aircraft, flying an aircraft. Mm -hmm. You and I are complex. Mm -hmm. Our decision making is not always predictable. The way we behave is not always predictable. Uh, right. making, making a souffle is complex. Flying an aircraft is complicated. So we first of all need to start understanding that context in different organizations, different circumstances is key and mm -hmm. systems are complex and adaptive, which means they're continuously changing, just like agility emerges from the way an organization behaves, so does learning, so do problems. Therefore, the tools and techniques we use also have to be adaptive and to cope with complexity. So what the flow system is, is a system of learning and understanding. What we did, we said, here we've got this foundational layer of lean thinking from this thing above here, this Toyota Way thing. Uh, we've got this sort of lean thinking, which I am firmly a big believer in, will always be until I stop functioning. There's eight decade, decades of knowledge there. So if you're working in a system that's linear, that's standardized, repeatable, or you can create standard work and repeatable process, Toyota's production system, lean thinking, will serve you very, very well. And there's decades of knowledge in there. But right. when you move into a world which is nonlinear, unpredictable, 
the current climate, I mean, the, the issues with the coronavirus shows us that we're in a complex, unpredictable, volatile situation that we cannot easily predict and we can't just apply simple lean thinking to. So then we need to start applying new tools. When we talk about downloading applications to track people, that's mass, mass sense making. That's bringing, that's creating a human, a human network to bringing vast amounts of usable data and to take the, the sort of big data and, and analyze the thick data and find the useful data. And this is enabling it to make sense of what's happening. So these are new tools and techniques that we need to make sense of our complex environments. Okay. Um, things like weak signal detection, and I won't go too long on this, but things on weak si signal detection, mm -hmm. we had weak signals of the coronavirus back in November when the doctor who lost his life, unfortunately, in, in who first uncovered this, was talking about this. And certainly by December, there's now established cases have been discovered in France from some of the epidemiology they've been doing, that there were French cases of this in December, but we chose to ignore all of this until it was too late. So there's right. new tools emerging that we now need to learn. So what the flow system did was said, okay, we've got this lean thinking. We know there's this complexity thinking discipline with people like Professor Snowden talking about the Kinevin framework, which scrum folks teach. I mean, it's been in, it's been in the, around the scrum world for a while. Right. Then we sort of said, well, leadership are now realizing they need to adapt new approaches. When Dave Marquette came out with commander's intent and turn the ship around, which we've renamed leader's intent to get rid of that commander word a little bit in business. And we right. started to look at the work of Dr. Amy Edmondson with psychological safety, which apparently is a great buzzword now, according to Forbes article that came out today. Things right. like active listening, actually hearing, not just listening to what's, what's been said to you. So we started to realize new leadership was necessary and, and techniques known as distributed leadership, where central coordination still happens in the hierarchy, but decision-making happens throughout the uh, organizational levels who do the work. And then of course, team science. We realized that we teaching people how to do tasks and setting them tasks and giving them a plan was not sufficient. We now needed people to work together and interact together both at the board level as well as at the team level. And so we realized we had to bring these, these three things together. And really all I did was draw three squiggly lines and twist them together and said, this represents the interconnections of these different disciplines. And it was actually Dan who was working for me at the time, Dan Ofchenik, who said, I love your DNA. And I went, that's it. It's the triple helix of flow. It's the DNA of organizations. Okay. So what this is is saying, look at your context, decide the tools, methods, techniques, approaches you need in your context, and apply them. When the context shifts, you may need to apply a different combination of tools, techniques, methods, and approaches. There is no one size fits all. There is no single prescription. Hence, the flow system can never be a prescription but it is designed to help you understand the interconnected nature of these things, how to apply tools in different contexts, and to give you the sort of uh, ability to take your agility to the next level without being doctri doctrinal in the way agile is applied. Because again, agility is an emergent property. That was a big answer for a little question. <laughs> yes, it was, Nigel. <laughs> okay, I've got two more questions for you. Sure. Um, what gives you peace of mind these days? Oh, wow. It's funny. I went to have a medical yesterday for life insurance. It's a thing you do occasionally. Okay. And, uh, I suffer with high blood pressure, surprisingly. And they took my blood pressure and it was 118 over 70. And I was like, that's the lowest it's ever been in years. I got to go back and talk to my GP about reducing medication. So it seems to be this home working things having a positive effect. I mean, I live in Texas, which is fantastic. The weather's beautiful outside most of the time right. now. And uh -huh. so and I started growing some vegetables. I started to realize my mental, and this is really an important message, started to realize mental health is incredibly important. I used the term Zumbi earlier on. I didn't coin that term. Dave Snowden used it the other day, but this constant staring at Zoom or Google Meet or Microsoft Teams or whatever is turning us into these sort of, you know, you know, video zombies, these Zoombies. Right. And what we're realizing is we need time away. We got to, and I walk away from the computer every couple of hours. I just go in the garden, I, I wander around, and I right. have some sun if, if the sun is out. But I started to grow veggies. 
because I used to do this years ago in Europe, so I started to grow some veggies because wow. I needed a way to completely remove my thought pattern. If I was doing something else, I was still constantly turning things over in my mind. So that's mm-hmm. helping immensely. Uh, a glass of wine helps occasionally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but things, peace of mind, I think the people I'm working with, I've got, I'm very, very fortunate. I've got some really good friends and colleagues, you among them and, and others out there that keep me level-headed, send me encouraging notes occasionally, ask me for advice. It makes me feel like I matter. And then, um, and then I go out and I do some other things, take my mind, clear my head completely, whether it's riding a bike or doing some, whatever, whatever you do as a hobby. But I decided to go shovel huge piles of dirt and, and, and grow vegetables and fight the birds to keep them away. Um, so that's, causing me to relax and I think that's incredibly important and that's one of the biggest lessons I've probably learned in the last couple of months that I never relaxed but staring Mm -hmm. at a stick all day is not the way to deal with it. And just for clarification when you say go ride a bike you mean motorcycle right? Well uh, for me it's a motorcycle. Exactly I want to make sure Uh, everybody else know. (laughs) A bicycle is fine but I mean the other thing you want to buy motorcycles are the ultimate form of social distancing you know you put yes, the visor yeah. down and you twist the grip and you then nobody's anywhere near you so uh, <laughs> but yeah i i do that but don't drink wine when you ride your motorcycle i just want to make that excellent yeah. point. Yeah. well my last well, question is about motivation what motivates you these days oh wow um I think, you know, I, I can't say who, but I had a conversation with a very large global corporation a few days ago. Mm-hmm. And they told me, and I don't mean this to, to any of my colleagues and, and friends in the agile world, but they told me they'd had enough of agile. They'd had enough of this sort of, yeah, I know, you're all shock and horror gasp and all that. Oh, my goodness. And, and it wasn't that it motivated me in, in that, but what they were saying is they wanted to go beyond. Ah, okay. To move beyond whether it's talking about the stuff in, that i've been talking about uh, to go as regards flow they want to look at they want people to help them solve problems they want to build better teams high performing organizations build mm-hmm. high high reliability organizations they want to solve problems right and that really excites me because they're not all just trying to you know drink from the agile kool-aid fountain they actually want to start opening their horizons and learning more tools and techniques and actually starting to make real change. And that and that was coming from senior leadership. So that really shows me mm-hmm. that there is a change there. They're realizing that agility is a, a, an incredibly important thing. Organizations mm-hmm. need to be very agile to be able to pivot very quickly, make decisions quickly, be very adaptable, very flexible. But this is an emergent property of the way they behave. Right. And it warms me and really excites me and, and drives me on to know that organizations want to change behaviors at leadership level, not just, at, you know, telling the, the folks who do the work to change, but everybody, because they realize they can do so much more by implementing some of this sort of new thinking. So I'm really excited about that at the moment. I'm, I'm very passionate. Of course, we're in the process of finalizing the book. The book will be out sometime in June. So okay. I'm excited that and and john and ponch are putting a lot of effort into there especially john turner he's really working hard bless him um so i'm I'm excited about that but i'm really motivated by the fact that industry are warming to what we are discussing in various forums and conversations and i purposely i'm not ramming it down the throat i'm just having conversations because i don't want to be selling another silver bullet another magic pill and and some sort of one size fits all solution because there isn't such a thing out there that's great to hear all right we get to turn the tables now before we close do you have any questions for me be nice (laughs) oh this is such a thing so you know it's amusing because three years ago Pam you sat in a room being interviewed by me and 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 now i'm being interviewed by you i'm incredibly proud of that i mean that just the stuff you've done and the things you've been speaking uh, you know the places you've spoken but the the stuff the knowledge that you've acquired has made me incredibly proud and i think that's pretty cool so apart from this where do you go next what's what's your (laughs) transcendent goal if you want what's your harada goal your transcendent goal for 2020 
Well, my, my goal after I kind of figured it out has always been to help as many people as I can. So I'm trying to figure out what avenues to use. Um, just one-on-one -on -one or even a small set of teams training all day, I realize is not the solution. You almost have to, I, one of the things I've done with the training I'm doing now with my current role is I broke the modules down and, and I'm giving to them in small pieces so we can do a little bit, understand it, train it, and then go actually use it. So I'm by that to, you know, potentially the Harada method or any coaching I do, realizing that, you know, when I first took your class, the Scrum the Toyota Away class, and I'd been doing Scrum for a while. And I, I know I went home and I just laid on the couch and I just, I couldn't even watch TV. My head just was exploding because this is someone who supposedly knows what they're doing. And then to, to look at all that was open to me, I realized that if I felt that way in your class, I can't even imagine how everyone else feels. And we don't learn that way. We don't consume mass quantities of information lecture style. And you know that's one of the reasons why they don't do that in schools anymore, because they figured it out. But yet somehow as adults, we still have all day trainings where we get different modules done from administration and stuff. And then the, your, your outputter to see if you've learned it is if you get the question right on the exam. So I can hold things in my head for a few minutes, but then as soon as it leaves, it doesn't mean I know anything. So what I'm really trying to do is apply a different way of approaching and helping people and maybe continually assessing and, and reiterating the key points so that they stick. And it's really nice when I say stuff and then maybe a week or two later, someone else says it to me and I think, oh, they got it. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm working on. I don't know that I have a set, you know, I'm going to go here in six months. I haven't put it down that way. But this was a big step for me. For some reason, I just thought, oh, yeah, I can host a show. No big deal. And well, you just we're just talking. I mean, there's nobody else out there, you know. Oh, there's nobody. Right? <laughs> there's nobody watching this. And it'll never be sort of uh, left on uh, YouTube for all prosperity. Mm -hmm. So, hey, look, let me ask you one other thing. So okay. uh, how can I help you in 2020? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Just to continue to do what you do, Nigel. You, you inspire and motivate a lot of folks, so. I would say that uh, if you have any, if you know of any good conferences or books, you just held up that book. I wrote it down, Lab Rats, because <laughs> I'm on a book reading uh, assignment now. So I would just say keep doing what you're doing and, and letting folks know and, and and speaking the truth, as it were. And, you know, sometimes it's just hard to hear. So work on well, that I, empathy, Nigel. Empathy. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no misery. Lots of hype there. Yeah. So, I mean, the great, the great thing is that I, I sort of, you know, I left Toyota at the end of last year. I, I Toyota had served me very well over the years. I, I think it's a wonderful company and I, I loved my involvement with them over the years. And I think I, I did a lot of good to help them over the years. At least I left some influence there. But now it means that I can be a little bit more honest uh, a little bit more blunt uh, and speak the truth a little bit more than perhaps I might have been constrained. You more blunt? No. <laughs> so, no. Um, but uh, I think, look, I think the world is full of amazing people. I think there's some incredible people. We know a lot of those incredible people. Uh, and I want a way to enable and empower people to learn far more than they've they've been able to do so far, to remove those constraints that are constraining their sort of fixation on certain things, to make them more holistic people, and to enable them to be able to get the, the roles in organizations and companies they want to do to help organizations and companies uh, achieve the uh, outcomes that they want to do for the people who matter most, their customers and the people who receive the value from those companies. Mm -hmm. um, if I can play a small part in that, that's that's really quite cool. I have a lot of people help me, and it's the if I can pay that forward a little bit, that's wonderful. But I am really, really, really proud of you. Thank you, Nigel. Oh, I can't wait to see the comments about this. This is going to be fun. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time, and we will talk soon. Thank you, Pam. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.